Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eidson. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. So hi there, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Art of Procurement. I'm here at the SIG Spring uh, summit in Washington DC and I'm delighted to be joined today by Linda Tuck Chapman and Linda is the president of Ontala, an advisory firm that helps companies with third-party risk management, outsourcing governance and sourcing optimization and, and Linda has previously enjoyed a number of practitioner side roles including as a CPO for BMO Financial Group, Fifth Third Bank and Scotia Bank. So Linda, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, the first question I want to ask that I often ask um, those who have been in the CPO role, and it's a little bit about your origin story in procurement. Was procurement something that you found, or did it find you? That is such a good question. So strangely enough, very early in my career, I was kind of like a chief operating officer for a small company. Mm-hmm. And the procurement, that I started actually with the procurement responsibilities and, uh, and eventually expanded into kind of their whole back office. And so then I went into the financial services side of the world and, um, and, and went through the ranks, right? I was a right. banker and I was ahead of the education uh, arm of the organization and I was in human resources. And I'll tell you, I, always, I was always looking for the right balance mm-hmm. between strategy, execution and results. Right. So in, when you're in the front line in banking, I mean, certainly you're very good at measuring your results, right? That's your only scorecard. And uh, when you're in a, in a human resources type role or a learning organization, it really is all about the strategy in the long term. Mm. And so rather than looking for a, for a job per se or looking for something in particular, you know, I sat down with a pr- proverbial list pros and cons. Going, what do I like doing and what do I, mm-hmm. I want to not do too much of? And I went I kind of out in the world with an open mind looking around to see what was available. So to my great good fortune, somebody phoned me and said, listen, we're looking to start this strategic sourcing organization. We've never done this before. Mm-hmm. I was with BMO Financial Group. And do you know anybody that in the company that you would recommend for this? So I kind of went away, checked my list, and I thought, uh, yeah, me. Mm-hmm. So I, I had to laugh. I mean, it was hilarious because uh, the executive who phoned me, it was kind of like he was closing a deal, right? right. Like, <laughs> you know, he's on a plane to wherever on vacation trying to get me to agree to whatever. But I was delighted yeah. because I love strategic sourcing. And I've, uh, you know, I learned from the learning organization. I had room nights to fill in classrooms, et cetera, that for me anyways, I like to have that 70-30 balance. So 30% of the job should be about strategy mm-hmm. and advancing the efforts of the company. And 70% about it, I think, is execution. And I really like measurable results. Yeah. So I, I just feel like when I found strategic sourcing and had the chance to build it the first time, um, you know, it was very early days, 1996. Yeah. It was, it was like I had arrived. Yeah. So rather than going from line and, you know, back and forth front office jobs and then staff type jobs and back out again... I found that perfect blend mm-hmm. of things that I love to do. And I also particularly like the fact that I had a foot outside of the company. Right. right? So always keeping an yeah. eye on the world outside yeah. and figuring out how, to, how does it make a difference here. So, you know, it's a little bit of both. I mean, I was out looking for something that hit all the, mm-hmm. the, all the you know, sweet notes and, uh, in, it, it, you know, in whatever my uh, chorus was, but also trying to minimize things that I didn't particularly enjoy doing. And it was synchronicity, and it found me, and yeah. I found it. So you, coming from a learning, or running a learning organization and coming yes. from a HR background, you know, those aren't necessarily skills that procurement look to when they're bringing folks into the organization because, and maybe, you know, that's bad on us that perhaps we should do. But I'm interested, kind of what did you bring or what was, what was it that you brought from that side of your background into procurement that... Um, you know, maybe others that are listening could, could take, you know, some, could build upon some of those experiences. Well, I work for BMO Financial Group, and, and uh, my responsibility, actually, in the learning organization, they had built a campus for the first time ever. They opened it with no curriculum. Right. right? So we had some credit training, and we mm-hmm. had some trainees, but we had no curriculum. And so that was probably the most intellectually stimulating role I've ever had in my life, working for people in learning and development who were, you know, kind of brainiacs off, you know, kind of trying to figure out pedagogies of learning, et cetera. Right. But my responsibility was to work with the business and I didn't have a learning background. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it was about strategy. Yeah. That was really my first real chance to build strategies because 
in order to move a workforce of you know multiple tens of thousands of people you have to have a long-term view because it takes a long time. Right. So that actually was, and then, but also I had like the practical side of things, right? I had to fill room nights and I had to, you know, budgets and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And so that was really, that was, was really what I brought to strategic sourcing is the ability to work with the business, understand where they're going, try to anticipate where they might be going, serve many, many, many different masters mm-hmm. because you have different parts of the organization. BMO Financial Group is very large and very yeah. complicated. And so how do you satisfy and bring something to the table for everybody and yet find that common whole? So I was able to bring my ability to, or what I really learned about putting strategies together, selling them because I had to get lots of money to execute them, and then actually being able to to execute and get and get the progress right. underway. So it was much more about the strategic side, but it, it still had, you know, that practical mm-hmm. side of it too, right? I mean, everybody's got a boss and budgets and and so on and so forth, and I had to keep that place full, right? So I had X number of room nights to fill yeah. every year. What was your approach to getting buy-in? You know, you said that you were, uh, obviously, the execution of strategies, you'd need to go and get the buy-in to for investment, but it's very similar from a procurement perspective when That's we're true. looking at getting buy-in from our stakeholders or from our suppliers, whoever it is within the ecosystem that we're trying to influence. I just love if mm-hmm. you could share some of your experiences in how you've been successful or how you were successful in getting buy-in. Because I came out of the banking side of the world, I understood what it took Mm -hmm. to deliver services to to clients. And because I had been in a lot of different roles, I mean, I moved around a fair amount, and I'd seen the front office and the middle office, et cetera, from a banking perspective. When you go in and speak to an executive, making sure that you understand their business Mm -hmm. is the number one criteria in order to understand what the business requirements are and their needs and expectations. So that was something that I brought into the learning organization and I was able to fine tune (laughs) to a very high degree to bring that into the strategic sourcing side of the world. And that's really how you get credibility. If you know the business and you can speak to the business, you can talk about basically how third party relationships can advance your business interests. Yeah, so then you both, basically it's that, the basic of alignment. It's understanding what they, Mm What the challenges are, what they're, what they're needing help in, as opposed to just going and, and, and thinking that you know, you know off the top of the head, because something we were talking about off mic before we recorded, the fact that they have a certain role doesn't necessarily mean that they have a certain, that you can assume a certain challenge or a certain problem. No, and so let me give you an example. When I went to Scotiabank Group, Scotiabank Group is a very large international bank. They're mm-hmm. probably, I think they're around $950 billion. They were, when I went there, basically, my mandate originally was kind of the headquarters, so I was based in Canada. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to focus on Canada, and that, that I did that for the first year. And then basically, as we started to spread around and look at, you know, they operate in 54 countries, 48 currencies. It's it's a big, complicated yeah. place. And so, but when you get down to basics, dealing with the marketing side of the world can be a challenge for sourcing professionals because that's a very specific expertise. Mm-hmm. And they really believe that most people don't understand how right. their world works, and they're probably right. So when you think about it, basically understanding what it is that drives and what are the strategic elements and what are what in fact are some of the tacticals Mm -hmm. the specific example i want to give is the capital markets uh, business really had never participated in the in the mothership any in any way so when we were doing our first initiative around media buy when i went to talk to the head of marketing for the capital markets group he told me they had never been able to get in the there's a national uh, newspaper that, that they wanted to be on on page three mm-hmm. right so you open it up and on yep. the, in the business first section page. yeah so, so not the first page no, the no, next page first time you open it yeah it's first right. time you open it they wanted to be in the right hand side yep. on page three yep. and because they were operating as if they were their own business not part of the mothership they never, you can't buy it, right? Mm-hmm. You have to have influence and you have to, have, so it's not that you could buy that spot. Right. You have to have a large relationship. So I said to him basically, I mean, why don't you come on board and we'll see what we can do together? Because when I add your spend to the mothership, it makes a bit of difference, but maybe mm-hmm. they can make a big difference right. to you. Mm-hmm. And I remember him coming to see me after we put everything in place opening up the newspaper and showing me that they were on page three. They've done it. <laughs> yeah. And like, those are the things that really, yeah. you know, that's where I get my kicks from. Yeah. Uh, being able to understand what they really want and how you can help deliver it is about the value proposition. So if I had gone to say to him, I could save you 10% on something, that is not a conversation that I'm going to have with the right. head of marketing for a capital markets group, believe me. They're very focused on money, but that's not the point. Mm-hmm. 
So as you've progressed in your career journey, were there some fundamental perspectives or beliefs perhaps that you know you took from one role to another that you still take from what you're doing today that really shaped your philosophy? Uh, it, it is very much about the value proposition. I, yeah. I've become a specialist in third-party risk management. And so just as savings are not the driver for a good conversation with a senior executive, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe some of them if they're in trouble that day. Right. But so savings, so compliance is not the conversation that you have about third-party risk. So what is consistent throughout my career is, to, is thinking about the value proposition for the, for the business and for the company. So when you think about uh, strategic sourcing and putting the right relationships in place, it really is helping to deliver the business value, but you have to understand what that might mean. Yeah. And what their contribution is towards the business value as an individual. Exactly. And so when you come to third-party risk management, if you go and talk about compliance, because I come out of financial services highly regulated, yeah. that is an eyes over conversation <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. So really, what's about the value proposition. So if, in fact, like I have a very strong philosophy that that a, a senior executive, they've got many, many things on their mind. The average decision takes nine minutes. Mm-hmm. They don't have a lot of time to deal with things. So if you can come and tell them about their most important relationships on a dimension of, of, uh, of, of they want to know how much it all costs, how much am I spending on things, of course, and manage that to the, the, you know, get the best value for money. But also if you can give them a lens into where there's undue risk, et cetera, that could harm their business. Yeah. And then the performance of the relationships, whether that's a revenue generator or whether it's a, you know, what are they doing for mm-hmm. you and, and are they performing in a way that's advancing the business? If you can come and have that, that storyline for a senior executive, that's what they all want. Right. At the end of the day, they are running their business and you are, f- you are helping to make their business more productive and more successful because when things go wrong on the risk side, it's yeah. very consuming, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's really stepping back and making sure you understand how your contributions, whether you're in strategic sourcing or risk or procurement, how are you making the business uh, more successful? And if you always keep that in mind, then you yourself will right. be successful right. because you Can will you, have a different conversation. Yeah. And, and the follow-on question I was going to ask, and maybe you just answered it at the end there, but and it may seem like a it has an easy answer, but how do you find that out? You know, how do you figure out what's really important to a stakeholder or a business unit or how they contribute to ultimately either the bottom line or a particular business strategy, you know, where they're creating value for the organization? Because it seems simple, like, well, let's just ask them. But a lot of times, you know, you can't ask them or they're not willing to share that, or perhaps they've not really even articulated that for themselves. So I just wonder how you would go about figuring out what's really the most important to them without them just, without sitting down and saying, hey, what do you care about? Well, I, th- I think, first of all, you just have to do your homework. I mean, I have the good fortune. I'm, I've worked substantially in financial services. Mm. I have an MBA in financial services. And so I've got lots of experience, yeah. and that, that helps. I do understand the business. But uh, when I first started dealing with uh, the, f- the first time I was at BMO Financial Group, I remember going in and working with the CFO in the Capital Markets Group. And I felt... I felt uh, stupid, actually. Mm. I thought, I I don't understand your business. I don't understand what's important to you. And so I went out and I became a licensed broker, not because I wanted to be a broker, but Mm -hmm. because I want to understand. Like, I I just felt like I I don't understand your business. So you understand how they work, how their business works. Yeah. So basically understanding, you know, sort of even the fundamentals of, you know, of of that side of the business. But it's also making sure you form relationships across the company because, you may not ask what's important, but mm-hmm. you can observe what's important. Right. And so, you know, I, 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 and the reason why I referenced capital markets, a, 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 I didn't understand it. And B, a lot of people who have never been in that business think that because there is so much money rolling through there that they spend money kind of nilly-willy, yeah. right, which may look like that to an outsider. The truth of the matter is they're incredibly focused mm-hmm. on the financial components of it. I, you know, so another thing I looked at compensation structures, right? It's different in different parts yeah. of the company. How do they get paid, mm-hmm. right? That that counts yeah, too. That, that influences their decisions or what's important to them for sure. Of course. So I think it's really making sure that you form relationships. I mean, people will uh, talk about themselves. I mean, here I am. I'm enjoying this as well. <laughs> so yeah. they'll talk about themselves and also, but if you start to get into reasonably informed conversations about their business, you will learn more and more and more. Right. And so. There's no easy answer, but there's many strategies, and mm-hmm. you do have to understand the business there. I don't see how you can be more than a transaction right. processor. Yeah. And that's something we struggle with, isn't it? Is how yeah. is going from, you know, we can be very strong 
procurement professionals, we can run great processes, mm -hmm. but it's always that ceil that kind of glass ceiling that we need to break through to go from, you know, somebody that's going to give us a call when they need some help in running mm -hmm. uh, a sourcing selection process versus somebody who, and, and it's kind of a cliche word, but is really going to be an advisor mm -hmm. um, and going to be somebody who's providing value that they couldn't get on their own to them. Well, I, I have bought hundreds of copies of the trusted advisor it's yeah. a little yellow you remember that one no i don't remember uh, yeah, okay so yeah. i don't it's two consultants who wrote this it's it was published years and years ago every place i've ever gone yeah. anybody who's in a strategic sourcing role and dealing with my with you know basically with our our business partners mm -hmm. i i mean i want them to have that book in their hand yeah. to understand what it means to be a trusted advisor you know another another thing that's maybe kind of counterintuitive but I have found really made a big difference for me as well, is understanding where, you're, where you all fit. And what I mean by that is, you know, I may have been a senior executive in a bank, but you've got like a CIO, you've got business heads, et cetera, yeah. who are all powerful in their own right. Yeah. And so it's a little bit hard for people to get their heads around, including your business partners, but I, I've never thought of like the CIO who's my peer as my customer, mm -hmm. right? So basically you have a job to do in order yeah. to make this company successful, yeah. as do I. And so my only customers are the executive management committee, including the CEO of the company that I work for, because they are they are the, they are representing the shareholder and the mm -hmm. customer in the decisions and strategies right. that they make. So they are our customer and we are all contributing to that. And that is, is quite hard for uh, some of your peers to understand when you when you first kind of exercise that philosophy yeah. because they may be used to being kind of kowtowed to and like you know the customer is mm -hmm. always right etc mm -hmm. but they're not your customer you are you all have a job to do to make the company successful yeah. and so you know eventually it can kind of get there it's a little bit challenging kind of getting everybody's heads wrapped around them. this is why we're all here yep and those guys at the top they are our customer yeah so building a, an alliance basically out of your peers yeah so that you're all trying to achieve the, you're helping each other achieve the same thing not that you exist solely you know to be there at their whim well there's two sides to that coin part of it is the alliance and the relationship and the other is also helping them understand that you are they, they you're not there to be told what to do right, right? Mm -hmm. just like you're not there to tell them what yeah. to do yeah. basically you're trying to find the best possible outcome we're all experts together. at what we're doing let's exactly put, let's yeah put so our I bring, minds together yeah we bring this expertise so yeah. and you have business needs and your expertise expertise as well and I think if you can if you can operate in a, in a way that can make that successful, then you're not turned off at the right. pass every time you want to you want to express an opinion. Yeah. Now we do see that in third party risk. There's you know the regulators in the financial services have introduced what they call effective challenge. Mm -hmm. So they are holding people who are in non frontline jobs accountable for challenging mm -hmm. right risk decisions that are a little wrong headed. Right, so it is your responsibility to challenge. So it makes everyone's, risk is everyone's responsibility. Yeah, and so that whole notion of effective challenge is really quite counterintuitive for people who are, are used to being in service to the business. Yeah. But in the long run, it's back to the original philosophy. We're all here to make the company successful. Mm -hmm. And so what does that really mean? And so, yep, if you are you know persist on, on pursuing this, when it clearly there's some awfully big holes on the risk management side, then I... I it's over my pay grade to yeah. agree with that. Yeah. And you just need to know that this is, it has to go to a higher level for decisioning because you and I, at our level, do not have the authority to right. put that much risk into the company. Mm -hmm. So let's get somebody else involved yeah. and they can help decide. Yeah, they can, you can share all the information with them, but. Yeah, and, and you may, it may be okay, but yeah. it's kind of, it's outside of the risk tolerance yeah. or the risk appetite of the organization. And so our whole profession is changing because you really do need to think about the life cycle, not about the deal. Mm -hmm. So this may seem like a flippant question or a stupid question even because um, I want to talk about risk. But you know, what do I, I find that risk, when we talk about risk within procurement, we kind of understand it and we kind of don't understand it. And yeah. some of it depends on the industry, whether it's a regulated industry or not. Um, and our experience and how and perhaps the risk tolerances of our organization as well and how much importance they place on risk. Um, what do procurement professionals need to know about risk? 
You have to have a good working knowledge of the sources of risks, uh, mm-hmm. understand risk taxonomy, and understand uh, how to uh, really risk management is identify, assess, manage, and control risk. Yeah. So number one, you do need to understand the fundamentals of risk to know whether or not it's even there. The assessment process is a procurement professional it usually gets handed off to somebody else who is, you know, think about cyber information security. Yeah. And so some of the new ones that I'm really, really fascinated by are, are model risk because mm-hmm. of robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, and intelligent automation. So when, when I start to think about, well, what drives those? Yeah. Mo- models and algorithms. So this is a new emerging risk most people are not really thinking uh-huh. about. So think about a learning machine yeah. changing itself. So you already bought a black box, and yeah. now you're, your black box is going to make itself new every minute of every <laughs> yeah. day. It's going to take all your information, and you're not sure how it's and you're making decisions based yeah. on what that black box is telling you without knowing right. how it's making those decisions. Yeah. So you don't want to get sort of carried, carried away with, with everything else without at least considering to say, listen, if, if we're buying a learning machine, how will we know that it's making changes that are in our best interests? Mm-hmm. And so... You know, so you need to know a lot about it. You need to know a little bit about a lot. Yeah. And so when you, when you come back to thinking about it, you know, I don't want to turn everybody into a risk nerd. Uh, it's really understanding how this how this actually sort of fits into your process. So if you can understand what the risks are, the assessment process is usually done by somebody else. Yeah. But you you need to understand how that works and why it's being done and. Yeah. And because it may not be done very well. Yeah, and some organizations may not have that formal framework. Um, mm-hmm. If you're in a regulated in this industry, then for sure you have a, a framework in place. But mm-hmm. I'm, I, I've come across, I'm sure you have, a lot of companies where they kind of talk about the notion of risk, but it's left to the individual buyer to really make the determination of what risks may exist and mm-hmm. whether that should inform contracting, sourcing, whatever, supplier management after the fact, whatever it may be. Well, I think it's unless the business has been really exposed to third-party risk, it's hard to wrap your head around because on one hand, your first filter should really be thinking about, well, how, how reliant will we, we be on this relationship? That's, yeah. to me, the first filter. The second filter is, is actually harder for the business to get their head around, and that is we are not assessing at this point in time on the selection process our operational risk. Mm-hmm. We're assessing their operational yeah. risk. And so all of the types of things you have controls in your own company, now you have to find a way to have a window into, you know, your critical relationships to see, well, how do they do things? Yeah. And is it a, that, are that okay with us? And that's really where I think that sourcing professionals and the business don't understand that this is independent of you mm-hmm. at this point in time, right? You want to understand how they run their business, what their, their controls are, and then you bring it back in to how it's going to affect your business yeah. when you have a relationship. So, so that dividing line is um, it's hard for people to get by. But what sourcing professionals have to know is, is I, the risk identification. And then you do need to understand about risk controls. And so mm-hmm. many of them have to, are contracts. But there may be more than that. Right. I mean, what if you can't get them to step up to some of your controls? Yeah. What are you going to do now? Yeah. So unless you have a, a, like a, at least some basic working knowledge, it's going to seem like risk nerds talking about <laughs> stuff. Yeah, and, and and I think that as, as well as and perhaps you captured that, you know, as 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 well as your supplier, it's also the supply the the risk that you may be bringing in through the, using a certain supply chain. Uh-huh. So because you uh, you don't know who they're doing business right. with unless you ask, and and where you know where they're located. So you got your geographic uh, risk, you have yeah. concentration risk, where you may be trying to diversify across a particular category with suppliers and all those suppliers end up being in the same city. Well, and, and that's why, I mean, I've learned a lot from my colleagues as well. I, I love this stuff. I learn every day. That's why a lot of companies do geomapping now. So mm-hmm. let's say you've got data centers that are, some of them are outsourced and some of them are yours. Wouldn't it be a good idea to geomap them right. and make they're sure they're not the within city. the same, <laughs> yeah, same place? Right. Because companies have done that and they yeah. found out, oh gosh, so that means if the, you know if you're uh, if there's a natural disaster there or something really bad happens, you know it's not yeah. just you; it's your third parties. Right. No. Because it's about business resilience in the long run, right? Yeah, I, I did that when I was back responsible for outsourcing. So I inherited the category. We'd done a lot of sourcing. Uh, it was for call centers, and so we'd taken the decision to diversify both from internal, external. This was in financial services as well, internal, mm-hmm. external, but there was also external across a variety of different providers. Mm-hmm. But what we hadn't thought about is where all those providers were all located. Surprise. And so you have a um, <laughs> uh, 
um, you know, a, a cyclone hits the Philippines and they're all in Manila, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden nobody can get to work. It so is it's true. It's great that you have everything. You've got. You think that you kind of. Re- patting yourself on the back for this, uh, for the great diversification that you've done. But in reality, you've actually concentrated all the risk in one location. Well, and it's interesting that you say that. So I recently helped a bank do some, uh, do some offshoring. Mm -hmm. And so, so they are very, very good at running their business, make no mistake. But when you, because I've got a risk lens on things as well, when we're talking about business continuity management, Mm -hmm. it's, we're not just looking at how the how they're basically how the the uh, third party is going to stand themselves back up again. It's kind of like, well, you just told me this is really critical to your business. Yeah. So if in fact they can't operate in Canton Volk, you know, it's, I mean, your example of the Philippines is very relevant, right? So many Manila is in. There's not usually any, any uh, you know, cyclones that go through there, but they could. They're on right. the coast. And when they do, it's a big, right. it floods the whole city. Yeah, so you want to open up the conversation to say, well, what if? Yeah. What if they really couldn't uh, recover right away? So you get into you know, cold and hot backup sites and the cost and what makes sense. And then the other thing that people really do forget to do is real bona fide contingency plans. Yeah. I mean, what if they can't restore? Mm-hmm because of whatever you right. don't know what whatever might be right what what will you do then right and that that allowed the company then to take that next step to say okay so what do we need to do on our side of the world be, just in case they couldn't invoke for mm-hmm. some reason so at least they're thinking and right. talking about it right like that's my what my job is at least to get it on the yeah, table that's kind like, of the mindset of it yeah yeah so basically okay yeah. so yep so we know what happens in this city basically do you need a backup somewhere does it make sense to try and bring things back to the U.S.? Mm-hmm. Or what, what, what would you do if? So I want to talk about scenario planning in a second because it yeah. ties in. But I think, first of all, I want to go backwards a little bit okay. and ask about, uh, because we can't mitigate all risks. Oh, heavens no. You don't um, want to. No. And, and we can't touch all suppliers. So what advice do you give organizations in terms of how they even think about taking you know, their 5,000 suppliers or the 25,000 suppliers, the 100,000 suppliers, however many they have, and actually narrowing down on the, the 10, the 50, the 100, whatever it may be, where that actually warrant the additional due diligence and everything that comes from a more formal kind of risk management and risk mitigation program. Yeah, and, and for any company, I would say that, first of all, most now I'm more familiar with financial services, yeah. but but any bank or, or within of any size in the or, or a financial services company would generally have no more than 15 quote unquote enterprise critical at the mm-hmm. very most. And so if you start to figure out in your mind what are you talking about when you're talking about business resilience, are there any companies you do business with who could totally bring you to your knees and, yeah. and halt your operations if in fact something serious happened? So that basically. Everybody knows who they are. You could probably list them off in companies yep. you worked with, right? Yep. So, so that's good. So basically then that's your most uh, highly critical. I'll be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Everybody does those well. <laughs> they're well-resourced. They're yeah. well do. Yeah, so basically you want to hide them off. It's easy to focus on those ones because yeah, everyone that's knows already, about them. Yeah, that's already happening. Yeah. So then you got, well, what about the rest? So the next thing is basically can you carve a lot off the bottom, mm-hmm. right? So, so uh, the way that you would do that is I think it's back to number I, I really do believe the first uh, filter is the business telling you about reliance, reliance for the business line or reliance for the company. Mm-hmm. And then you can find a way to homogenize it across the company so it starts to make some sense because yeah. what's important to you might not actually right. be important to the company. And so you homogenize it. And then the next thing is basically, are there any key risk characteristics? So, you know, access to networks, yeah. access to systems, do you basically what type of what type of activities you've already covered off? So it's a data thing. You already know it's highly critical. Mm-hmm. So the next thing basically is you know that they have your data. It's in production data. Da 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 da. So that's easier to spot. But when it comes right down to it, I would say that most companies should start with a with a manageable handful of key risks for according to their business and mm-hmm. to their industry, and focus on those and be able to identify char- characteristics. If if you say yes to any one of these, right, it you're in the fold. A, it's something that you need to do some additional due diligence. Around. Exactly, and so but you want to put a reasonable line in the sand because yeah. the populations are so large and say listen, they're like I need some buy off, but we're coming back to these later. Unless it, I mean everybody's. I mean, Target, unfortunately, is yeah. going to have that associated with them forever. Yeah. But in that case, they had access to, to networks. Right. Right. So if you are a good sourcing professional, you would have asked. You'd be able to see who, who has access to your network and who has PCI data, for example. Yeah. And so if that ever came through a process, you may not have spent much time on it because it's a, 
you know, a very small dollar value mm-hmm. contract. So you might have a standard contract. But if you, you know, just ask a couple of key questions, did they have access to network, did they have their data, blah, blah, yeah. blah, you would have noticed right off. Right. And you would have said, you would have gone back to the business and say, listen, it's not reasonable for them to have access to mm-hmm. our systems. How can we satisfy your business need by not doing that? Right. Right. Because um, that is a conversation with the business. If you go and point out key risks to them that they are aware that this isn't a very good idea, quite often you can change the structure of the deal or the structure of the services, yeah. et cetera, to, re- to eliminate that unnecessary risk. Yeah. And therefore, you can get through a process. Yeah without tying yourself up yeah. in knots. And that's, I think, something that people really miss is, is if you're a good sourcing professional, deal structure counts because right. there's no two alike. Yeah, you can mitigate a lot of those risks through contracting. Well, not just even through, even through the structure of the yeah, deal itself is basically, yeah. you know, is in that particular case, you should never have unfettered access to yeah, the network. You should have partitioned them mm-hmm. to that building or buildings. So there are ways, there are ways when you understand what the risk is that you can change the risk profile and still have the relationship. Yeah, Yeah, and one of the things I wanted to get out was that this can seem like a really overwhelming topic when you're thinking about thousands and thousands of suppliers that you have, but it really doesn't need to be. Mm -mm. There's not that many suppliers that you really, um, you know, when you're starting, for sure, you need to bring into a third-party risk management program. Um, you're just asking the questions of what's the risks, as you say, that are most important to you. What characteristics do they have? Starting there. So it's not like everything else that you're doing has to be applied to thousands of suppliers. It's really just on the ones that matter the most. Well, it, the concept of risk-adjusted mm-hmm. uh, work effort and controls is something that takes a while to build. And so, you know, early days, especially if you're in highly regulated, it's just, you know, you just have to be careful. You don't get tanked. So you just right. draw a line in the sand and yeah. say, we'll do the rest of this later. But having said that, the, the notion of being risk adjusted means that, let me go back to the business continuity management example. So if you're dealing with a provider where their business continuity management is really, you don't actually care because you can replace them fairly easily. Yeah. Then, or you're going to work around, don't spend any time right. on it. If they're running your data center, then you want to actually make sure that you have the right to participate in testing, mm-hmm. right? You want, to, you want to actually take so it down and resili- bring it up. Your confidence in the resilience. Yeah. It? And so, so those two extreme examples, and there's ones in between. Maybe you just need a, evidence that they have a business continuity yeah. program. So I think bringing the concept of what do you actually need is really, I, I had the very same conversation just yesterday, because you can imagine everything that could possibly go wrong, and then you get lost in yeah. the noise. It's really just stick to the basics and focus your efforts on what you really do need to pay attention to and leave the rest aside. Yeah. So because you're right, otherwise this is just a, it's a giant bottleneck and it does just feel like compliance. And so that doesn't serve anybody well. Right. Now, I like to do it at a category level as well. So yes, I good found point. that um, the organizations that I worked in that were regulated, which were financial services organizations, we thought about this on a supplier level because, yeah. you know, you'll pick your 10 suppliers, your 20 suppliers, whatever. Um, but kind of taking a step back as a category manager, looking holistically across your portfolio, you know, you may, having contingency plans across your portfolio, you may not necessarily need to go deep dive risk assessments, but at least having some optionality based into all your choices. Um, so one, any one supplier on its own may not flag as a particular big risk, but what happens if, um, so I was working with a pharmaceutical company and the compound that they sourced was only came out of one company and one factory in China. Mm-hmm. That, that factory got closed down because of the Olympics and pollution in Beijing in 2008. Um, so looking at, at it from a product perspective to say, if the worst would happen, mm-hmm. what are we actually going to do about it? Mm-hmm. Um, so at least you have some options within your category strategy, even if it's not at an individual supplier level. You definitely know your stuff. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's. I think I was really informed by, I'd never really thought about risk that much until I came mm-hmm. into financial services, which is one of the reasons I'm really interested in talking about it because, I mean, sometimes regulated industries go a little bit too far. Yes. And the mm-hmm. environment that I was in, we definitely did because I came in um, 10 years ago when we weren't a financial services company. We took TARP money to basically survive and were converted into a bank holding company Mm -hmm. and had 18 months to put in place of risk frameworks when none existed. We had the Federal Reserve sat in our building watching us doing it. Mm -hmm. So we were under a lot of pressure to do that. Mm -hmm. But through doing it, I saw 
the value that comes through risk, even if it, for a lot of organizations, they don't need the rigor mm-hmm. that um, so, so a company that has the Fed sat in your building does. Mm-hmm. But in a non-regulated industry, we, we often think about so much of risk of just being, I'm just going to go and do a financial health check and I'm going to do that once every year or once exactly. every two years or once when I sign the contract. And if it looks good, I'm done. I don't have to worry about it. And there's just so much more to it to me that non-regulated industries can take, I think, from what is kind of forced on a regulated industry. Well, the good news is I'm sure that was like 10 years ago, right? So the good news is that there's 10 years of expertise and experience. So if you're new to this, Mm -hmm. uh, you can leapfrog a lot of the things that other organizations did. And the other thing is, I mean, you know, I think that that the getting to contract the financial services sector has put a lot of good practices in place. Mm-hmm. So John Eckert, who was the head of operational risk at the OCC, wrote uh, 201329. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're familiar with, but OCC yeah. 201329 is really really a good guide to what yeah. you might want to think about. Yeah, even for non-regulated industries. Except, I, that's I, what I'm saying is yeah. like go go I'll pick a, up. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But yeah, absolutely. Okay, so there's that the mm-hmm. FFIEC, which is a group of regulators. Yeah put together what's known as Appendix J. And Appendix J is all about business continuity management, mm-hmm. resilience, and continuity planning. I mean, why reinvent the wheel? They've right. got lots of good... You don't have to do it, right, if you're not, yeah, if you're you not in the industry. The that, but, yeah, pick, pick up the bits that you like. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the other thing that you said I thought was super interesting is this whole notion of category strategies, which is coming into third-party risk management. Mm-hmm. So because there's so much volume, even on the supplier side, and, and third parties are more than your suppliers, right? It's like yeah. everybody you do business with. Yeah. So, But if you go back to category strategies, that's a good way to manage and, and manage down the workload. So uh, so basically, if you had shrink wrap software as a category, mm-hmm. right? Think about basically any type of shrink wrap software that somebody might buy and put on your machine, et cetera. Yeah. What, are the, what are common characteristics uh, yeah. in terms of risk? And so you might put some controls inside about something. I mean, you can't really, it's hard to stop people in certain companies from loading software. So so basically the controls you might want to put in place for the contract, if there's a larger buy, are what? Mm-hmm. Right, so you may have a couple of standard clauses right. that you put in there. It's like using the cloud, right? So what a lot of companies have done is, is they qualified, say, two or three large cloud providers and have at it. Mm-hmm. Have at it, right? We've already vetted them. They're yeah. fine. If you want to go off our standard, then basically you're going to have to go through quite a lengthy process that we're going to make extremely difficult to bring in somebody else. So if you think about category strategies, when it applies to not just the spin side of the world and the sourcing, but start to think, can you do some blanket assessments on them, determine what the controls are that you need to put in contracts or internally Mm -hmm. or whatever, and then you don't have to do every one, right? right? Like, here's the formula. Could you just apply it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that makes, that kind of gets a lot of noise out of the airwaves. Because it can be so onerous doing... I remember when we did it, I think it was using the BITS framework when we, this was this 10 years ago, mm-hmm. but we had two or 300 questions in a questionnaire that we would send to send our to suppliers. Everybody. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it was so, and it was touted as the industry standard. Everybody's using it. All your suppliers will be familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Well, that may be one thing. So let's just say everyone's familiar with it and they answer it. You still got to compute and do something with that data that you get, which mm-hmm. is so overwhelming. So I think one of the things that's really important is to try and you know, ask as, as as few questions as you possibly can to get as much of the information that you need. And without, don't go fishing. Yeah. Don't go looking for yeah. something that, unless you have a very good reason to right. believe that risk might exist. Because mm-hmm. that's a huge temptation of risk specialists, right? They go fishing and then it takes They'll a long time. always find something. Yeah. Well, of course you do. Yeah. And, you know, it's back to your comment. I mean, you, you, you there's no... There's no rationale for trying to remove all risk because you you would have no business then. So it's, you know, think about your risk categories, broad categories. You know, uh, most companies have uh, categorized their data, right? So they have different levels of data, Mm -hmm. even, you know, so is it NPPI, which is highly regulated, or is it something that's public? And that's when you can do the filter up front to say, what is it and how much? Yeah, what kind of information? Yeah. And also is interesting to me is... How much are you going to protect your confidential data versus, you know, MPPI data? Exactly. Because there's Different. a big difference between the two. Yeah. And a lot of organizations that I've worked with or seen have tried to put in protect protections that you may anticipate for uh, NPPI. Um, 
but it's for their own confidential data. That's not to say that their confidential data isn't important, because obviously <laughs> it is. But should they be approaching different data with a different lens in terms of what they really need to do to protect it? Well, and you can never get through contracting because um, if you've worked in a company where there has been a serious incident or someone close to you in the industry, then everybody kind of freaks out, right, and tries mm-hmm. to buckle down on all the controls. But the truth of the matter is that you have to be sensible in terms of what kind of controls you're asking yeah. for. So uh, I, I had one recently where they wanted me to assign, I have a very small business, right? Yeah. I'm an advisor. Yeah. And I was providing advisory services, and it, which was an expert opinion. And they wanted me to not only assign my company's insurance, but they wanted it to be forever. And mm-hmm. they wanted to cover all their employees and their, and their, you know, their, like, and I just said, I mean, I, I actually, am, I'm never signing this. So yeah. if we can't change it, then I'm sorry, I, I, I can't agree to this particular clause. Right. So, so could you back it down a bit to, cause think, cause tell me what risk I'm presenting to you because I'm not going to agree to do that. So mm-hmm. let's get back to basics. Yeah. And what do you really need from me? Because I know you need some protection. Right. Well, yes, I have tra- insurance. What are you trying to protect against? And there's a difference yeah. between, we have this as well actually with a, with a prospect right now that we're working with mm-hmm. that again, we're a small business. It's, mm-hmm. you have a set of an infosec policy, for example, which is very good if you're working with a Fortune 50 company, mm-hmm. but not yeah. so good when you're dealing with a smaller <laughs> company. So the question right. is, you know, how can we, how can we as organizations who are doing the buying kind of ensure that we're not giving up innovation because we have too onerous um, requirements in terms of InfoSec or insurances and, uh, that, that are put in place for risk management purposes, mm-hmm. but they're just used as a one-size-fits-all. Well, it's interesting that you say that. So I'm, um, I have a book coming out uh, this week okay. on third-party risk management, driving enterprise value. So I'm presenting to uh, uh, at a fairly large uh, risk executive, um, uh, sorry, it's a conference with risk executives mm-hmm. in the financial services sector. So it's a bit intimidating, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> they're all specialists. So. Yeah. Anyhow, but, but I actually, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on is, is this balance between risk and reasonableness. And I really, I think you really do need to deal with innovative companies, especially small startups that can't, or, or small companies that you, you actually do want them to hit your risk hurdles and they can't. Right. So I really, one of the things I'm going to talk about is I call it the innovation conundrum. Mm-hmm. Like you really want it, but you can't have it because right. it can't pressure yeah, you risk can't. hurdles, uh-huh. right? And so the innovation conundrum is, is solvable to some degree. And so one of the things you can do is if you really need all that stuff, give them yours mm-hmm. and help them implement it. Yeah. Send people into you, their company and help them stand it up if you really actually need that. Because yeah. if you want to work with them so badly, they've got something fantastic and you need to get to market. Well, then you need to make it easy for them to work with you. Right. It's worth the investment on your side to actually help them become compliant with what you need. So in one of my roles, I was the uh, chief uh, procurement officer for Fifth Third Bank. And one of the things that attracted me to that role, I went from a very large bank to to a smaller bank. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I really liked about that role is I did have involvement in any third-party relationship that was not actually acquiring a bank. I mean, I had a job to do there on the due deal. But uh, so because I had a banking background and I had, you know, I'd done lending and whatnot, I I had a pretty good grounding in this stuff. So one of the things that I pitched in the role that I helped them design for me, because it was the first, is I said, basically, if you get into joint ventures, M&As, et cetera, Mm -hmm. you acquire companies, I want to be part of that. Because I have seen what happens if you don't do the commercial relationship between your two companies at the same time as you're taking an equity stake. Or if you sell a business and then you become their customer. Mm -hmm. Because when large deals with small, especially when you have all these expectations as a big company, what they're going to do and how they're going to behave, etc., on one hand, some days they can be your partner. And on other days, hey, we're a small company, go away. Right. Right? So you really want to... You really want to design the relationship up front. So I can think of a company we took an equity stake in. I went on their board. I was part of their operating committee. Mm -hmm. And so I had a pretty, you know, pretty firm foot in both camps. I could see what was going on in the company, which was comfort to the company. But also I could help buffer some of that stuff. Yeah, so that was actually a pretty fun thing. Yeah, because I I figure that's a big challenge, especially in an environment like financial services, is there's a desire... But the, the processes, the policies, mm-hmm. they kind of get in the way of it. 
and, mm-hmm. and, and some organizations do a better job of managing that. Yeah, and, and basically, so, so when it comes back to the innovation conundrum, when you think about, about sourcing, and I mean, we, we had a, uh, a workshop this morning, and, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, the pace of business is so fast, yeah. and, and, you know, people don't plan, and people turn over in jobs and all that kind of stuff, so it's, it really is very reactive. And so how do we as sourcing professionals stay current with that? So uh, Viet Ho, who is the Cheaper Corona Officer at uh, Russell Investments, yep. I asked him to co-present with me. So he has become not just the CPO, but also he is the, uh, he's the head of their transformation group. Mm-hmm. Interesting development. I think that's fabulous. Yeah. And so he has actually carved out of his team two people just to be out and about to deal with this stuff that needs to get done right away. So they're in the business, they're understanding the yeah. strategies, et cetera, and their job is just to get this stuff that has to be done at the speed of light done yeah, so they can move now. quickly yeah and i thought that was really a good yeah. solution because we don't have answers we don't know everything the world is changing so fast and we can't respond so on one hand we have process and due diligence etc and on the other hand the business need has never been mm-hmm. greater for our services so i thought it was an interesting solution yeah and that that his company that russell investments is actually thinking along that line as well so they're giving him the ability to uh, help them move quickly well the underlying message is be strategic respond to the business because like the question you asked me i mean obviously he has figured out how to be adding value and be relevant etc so they give him a cool new responsibility too right that's kind of rewarded Absolutely. Um, I want to, before we wrap up, because I I pulled it out earlier, um, that I wanted to go back to scenario planning. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to touch on it briefly, um, because I I was going there, then I went backwards in terms of scale and scope, because this is where it can seem overwhelming in terms of trying to do this everywhere. But how deep do you recommend? So for those most important relationships, or even at a category level, you know, how much scenario planning um, or what are some of the considerations, I guess, is a better way to ask it, uh, in terms of building out different scenarios? Should we be doing as procurement professionals? Well, the, the business owns a risk, mm-hmm. and I think you need to put that front of mind. And so it really is, to me, it's more uh, find, finding ways to create opportunities for rich conversations with the business because they need the business preparedness, and you can be an enabler and if you have a good body of knowledge so that you can provoke the right conversation, in the end, they, they will decide themselves. Yeah. And so I, I think it's really being well-informed, being able to find a way. You have to have the skills yourself to be able to float those conversations at pretty senior levels. Mm-hmm. Because what I've seen is, I guess what I learned in my last role as a chief procurement officer is at the more senior levels, they don't actually have a good view of the risks in their business, et cetera, because so much gets handled yep. at lower levels. So it's making sure that you bring the right conversations up. And if you understand which are the most critical relationships and you have some reasonable, plausible, I mean, we're not talking about black swans, right? right. We're talking about things that could really happen. Yeah. And so the business does need to be prepared. Now, if, in, if there's an event, a serious risk event, you also need to understand what your role is. So in my last role as chief procurement officer, I also had third-party risk. Mm-hmm. And so, the, so third-party risk is interesting because every risk – uh, discipline in your company. If you are also responsible, if you're responsible for third-party risk, you need to now turn those all of that knowledge outward, right? So now you're considering, you're helping develop processes yeah. to consider all that o- outside the company to bring it in. So in the event of a of a serious um, uh, catastrophic event or a loss event, your job in third-party risk management is to is to know who's on first, mm-hmm. right? So if it's a privacy breach. You're not on first. You right. need to make sure that the people in privacy know that yeah. they're on first, yeah. <laughs> right, with the business. And then you're coordinating other yeah. efforts in behind. Now, if it's something around supplier performance, chances are you're going to be on first, right? Mm-hmm. So it's really making sure that you have the right conversations internally so that you are prepared to respond to the, un, you know, sort of the unpredictable, mm-hmm. knowing where one fits. And it's not a crisis plan. It's basically... These things can happen. What do we do when that when they do? Yeah, right? How quickly they will. can we respond? Yeah, and sort of who's responsible for doing what? And yeah. those are good conversations to have with your risk specialists in particular, because in this case you might be dealing with information security mm-hmm. and fraud and all these different groups to say, listen, if this happens, it may come to any one of us first. So if it's a if it's a major fraud that's happening or you know something like that, you're on first. We will we will all support you because we have a role. Yeah. 
but we're not we're like you're at, yeah you're yeah. you're it because we are not the fraud expert yeah. we're not the privacy expert so and I, I I think that when it comes down to scenario planning it really is up to the business to determine what plausible risk scenarios are and then you can help mm-hmm. now I do know because I run the risk management associations I facilitate their roundtable which is 35 executives it's kind of a fluid group right we get together twice a year very very candid confidential conversations. And uh, so at the last one in February, someone, a third-party risk management executive, was saying that they, they have been doing a major catastrophic event scenario analysis internally. They have involved hundreds of people in the company, and they had already invested nine months. Wow. So I'm guessing it's probably like a glass house kind of yeah. network services, you know, for that much effort. And that's happening in, in different companies. And there, if you have, if you're good, fortunate enough to have an operational risk group, I mean, there's some people out there who are amazing at leading these things. Well, Linda, unfortunately, it's uh, time to start wrapping up yeah. um, because I have a ton of other risk-related questions I could have gone down. I have my questions in front of me. I probably have touched on half of them, but uh, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today um, in uh, patiently asking, uh, answering any silly questions that may have come your way. Um, the last question is the easy one, as I tell all my guests. And that's just if, if anybody who's listening would like to know a little bit more, um, would like to reach out and connect with you, mm-hmm. what's the best way of them doing that? Well, contact me directly. I'm mm-hmm. always happy to have a conversation. Yeah. Tr- I truly mean it. I mean, at a point in my career, I feel almost like an elder statesman, <laughs> right? I mean, I have the luxury of, of, um, of really wanting to spend so much time to help others. And I've always kind of been like that, but yeah. I have more time to do it now. Yeah. So um, it's uh, Linda Tuck Chapman at Ontella.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have two phones, so I'll just give you one, 416-452-4635 is right. my cell phone. Or you can go on my website, ontala.com, O-N-T-A-L-A.com, and there's a contact me page, awesome. obviously. Don't we all have one? Well, what I'll do is I'll include the links to your website. Thank you. Um, and I will probably include your email address, but masked yep. so that people don't start spamming you um, on our show notes page for today's episode. Um, that's going to be at artofprocurement.com slash Antala. That's artofprocurement.com slash Antala. Linda, thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks for making the easy conversation. No problem. Thank you. It. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Art of Procurement. To find an archive of all past episodes, you can go to artofprocurement.com slash episodes. And to ensure you never miss another show, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Mm-hmm.